Okay, so now we're talking about the DuPont case study. Um, long story short, I had presented the Alcoa case study at Georgia Tech in uh, 1999, and in the audience was a gentleman from DuPont Pharmaceuticals, um, came up afterwards, hand me his card and said, we look exactly like Alcoa did before you started your project, and we want to look exactly like Alcoa did after you finished your project. How can we hire you? At the time I was working at Siemens, I said, you can't hire me, I'm working at Siemens. And long story short, he talked me into working for him as a consultant, took a couple weeks off on vacation from Siemens and never went back because I had so much fun going up to DuPont and Garden City, New York and helping them figure out how to turn that plant around. And it was around that same time that, that we started SAK Logistics. So the biggest problem they had initially, and I'll just let the I'll just go through the slides. The slides kind of speak for themselves. This presentation is about a year and a half after that. After I'd been working with that plant in Garden City, New York for about a year and a half, Glenn Gerke, who was the plant manager, um, was paying for multiple projects. The first few projects were to go up there and just do a site assessment of how they could improve their plant. Uh, then we did some training for his plant uh, to teach them factory physics principles and how to use spreadsheets like the one we sold to Alcoa. Uh, and then he said, you know, we really need some tools so the people on the shop floor can implement all this after you leave and make sure they're running the right stuff at the right time, with low cycle times, et cetera. So that's when we sold them things like the cycle time information system and slow path health. And we'll get into that in the case study. So this presentation is after all that was implemented and his plant had cut his inventory by roughly 50%, which was worth nine or $10 million. Um, he said, you know, we really should show this case study uh, at various conferences. So we did. This was from a presentation that Glenn and I did together at a conference in Philadelphia. Um, wasn't particularly well attended, if you notice the date. Um, <laughs> uh, but it was, it, was, it was still a good enough conference, good experience for Glenn and, and me, uh, and has resulted in a case study that today we can still use, because uh, it was approved by DuPont. Uh, about a month before, maybe two months before, this case study was presented in, in uh, Philadelphia, Bristol Myers Squibb announced that they were acquiring DuPont. So Bristol Myers Squibb approved this case study before we gave it. So that means we can still give it. Uh, anyway, that's just all historical background. So this presentation, I thought about using some updated versions of this. Like I've got a version that's on the Invistix slide template, but I thought it was more fun to show the version from 2001. Um, Glenn gave the first part of this, and then I gave the, the rest of it. And there's some crazy animation and, and sound effects that Glenn put in there. Actually, Glenn's assistant put in there, but I didn't bother to take them out. So the way we're going to lay out this case study is we're going to talk about background. Then we're going to talk about the things they did before they hired Invistix. It was SAK Logistics, but I'm just going to say Invistix. Then they're going to think, talk about the things they did after hiring us, including installing our software. Um, I got an intranet site demonstration, which is you know version 0002 of our software, um, on how they use tools like CTIS, and then some lessons learned and we'll do Q&A. Interrupt me if you have a question, just like on the other case today. So imagine, if you will, I'm Glenn Gerke. A couple people have met Glenn. Charlie, you've met Glenn. Uh, Scott, you met Glenn. Because mm -hmm. he's now the plant manager at VMS MyQuest. Um, their mission was to partner with the R&D organization at Bristol Myers Squibb, earlier DuPont, and deliver new products to the market. So they were trying to be that part of the manufacturing network that would be able to sell the brand new products, where it's hard to know exactly how much demand you're going to have, it's hard to know how much capacity to build, just because there's so much new about these new products. Um, this is a medium-sized plant. You can see some of the statistics, just under 400 employees. I had 150 product SKUs, not nearly as complicated as what we did a few years later in Indiana. Um, the 35 million packages, what this plant was making is prescription medication. They made hypertension medication, they made uh, an HIV uh, medication, um, and a couple of other uh, blood thinning uh, medications. Um, and it was a mixture of R&D, make to stock, and make to order. Um, so some of the products they were making was a one-off batch that R&D need to figure out, if I run this at a production scale, what kind of quality do I get? 
So this was almost like an engineered to order batch. Um, they'd make it once and probably never make it again. Um, if the product took off, or that formulation took off, then they might have to come back and make more of it for the actual sale to the customer. Um, some of their products were made to stock. Um, they had some pretty high volume products, and they would send that out to distributors either owned by DuPont or owned by uh, big healthcare pharmaceutical distributors like McKesson or Cardinal Health. Um, and some of them were made to order. So they'd have specific um, orders for this HIG, HIV medication from some country in Africa, and they would ship off you know, three containers full of those pills to that country in Africa. And it was one of three plants that DuPont Pharma had. Um, two of them are still running and part of EMS, Manatee, Puerto Rico, and, and Burn City. Okay, so imagine Glenn. Glenn joined this particular plant around 1998, 99, and this was their forecasted growth. They had this huge ramp up from about 500 million dosage a year to about 2,000 dosage a year, uh, and about half of that growth was going to come on Glenn's watch. Um, it was a pretty uh, scary situation for him because as he looked at what he inherited, He had very long cycle times through his plant. It was taking him almost six months to get the chemical from the receiving dock all the way through the operations of the pharmaceutical plant into a finished product and shipped out the, the, the shipping door. Um, and it sounds horrible, but if you read CFO Magazine, the average cycle time for a pharmaceutical company is six months. So this is about average for the pharma industry. Um, very high grip levels. Um, their shipments were very low. Um, shipping performance was very low, uh, on the order of 60 to 70 percent. Um, they didn't have enough capacity to keep up with demand, and that was very scary. Because uh, if you miss an order in the pharmaceutical business, you're talking about patients not getting their medication. Um, and that's a big deal, as you can imagine. Um, a lot of the things that we talked about in the Alcoa case study were true here. They had a departmental functional organization. I'll show you a picture of what it looked like. Um, they had push work release. They were running pure MRP. They had a BPIC system running on AS400, and it told them when to release a batch onto the floor. Um, they didn't have any flow. Um, they didn't have any way to tell people on the floor exactly what to run next other than print out these big MRP reports that were about this thick. Um, and as a result, people would pretty much run whatever they wanted. Uh, and disjointed information systems. Um, we did a project to look at all their information systems. They had seven different information systems, everything from their MRP system to a homegrown MES system to a barcoding system to uh, a documentum system where they kept all their recipes to a limb system. None of them talked to each other, literally. Okay, so uh, Glenn liked to joke, this was me coming into the office, and these were all the challenges staring me in the face. And he summarized them on this slide, that he knew he had to grow his volume to keep up with that big increase in sales. But he had been told, you can't hire any new people, you can't spend any more capital to buy more equipment, and oh, by the way, your building, which is in Long Island, New York, in Garden City, is completely landlocked, and you don't have any room to expand. And you're already four stories high, and code says you can't build a fifth story. So you talk about a pretty constrained environment. That's where he was starting. And then he tells jokes about how much the bear is saliving, uh, salivating, and whether it looks like his boss and all that stuff. OK, so what was he looking at in terms of the process? Almost everybody knows this because we talk so much about pharma. I'll go fast through it. This was a classic solid uh, oral mm -hmm. dosage pharmaceutical plant where you start off with blending. You're dumping chemicals into a big blender. It doesn't look like this, but this was the best graphic we could find. And you, you weigh up these ingredients. You mix them together for a certain number of hours, maybe six hours. Uh, and then you dump that out. You clean all the vessels out, and you put a new product in or a new batch of the same product. Then you move that batch over, generally with a fork truck, 